Well, hi, I'm Pastor Mark Williams. This summer here at North Cleveland, we're talking about authentic Christianity from the book of James. Today, we come to James chapter three and talk about words. There are more than 1 billion 500 million words that comprise the 7,100 spoken languages in the world. And each of them contain the power of life and death. And here in James chapter 3, we are reminded that our words do have power. They have power for good, but they also can be used for damage. And we are reminded today that sometimes the one place that all of us stumble is with the words that we use. But oh, the potential. When those words and our tongues are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the blessing that can come, the life transformation that can occur when we begin to speak God's words and use our mouths for the praises of God. So join me as I share with you today's message, keeping it real with the words that we speak. The television crew of Mythbusters decided that they were going to conduct an experiment just outside of the town of Dublin, California. They wanted to test the power of a cannonball. So they located a old bombing storage range. They set up trash cans and filled the trash cans with water and prepared to fire a cannonball about the size of a cantaloupe into the trash cans filled with water and measure the projectiles. They made the preparations, fired the cannonball, and they were not prepared for what happened. In fact, the Associated Press, in the news article that they gave, put it like this. The cannonball missed the water, tore through a cinder block wall, skipped off a hillside, flew some 700 yards east and bounced in front of a home in a quiet neighborhood. It ripped through a front door, raced up the stairs, blasted through a bedroom before exiting the house, leaving a perfectly round hole in the stucco. It then crossed six lanes of traffic on Tassajara Road, took out tiles from a roof on Bellevue Circle, before finally slamming into and coming to rest in a family's beige Toyota minivan in a driveway on Springdale Drive. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Here's the report from the Associated Press. Up. For the cast of Mythbusters, blowing things up and firing weapons is routine, but this experiment went horribly wrong. The Alameda County Sheriff's Department says the cast was measuring the speed of projectiles fired from a cannon, but the cannonball missed its intended target and instead went through a concrete wall, bounced off a hillside, then straight through the front door of this house, bursting through the wall. They were actually sleeping at the time. So they didn't uh, actually hear the cannonball come through the house. And the cannonball didn't stop there. After exiting the home and bouncing off the roof of another, it smashed through this minivan. With and your hands, show us how big that cannonball was. That was about this big. There. That was a good five, ten inches. And yeah. how much did it weigh? Well, I didn't touch it. <laughs> I mean, it probably weighed ten, ten pounds at least. The Alameda Sheriff's Office says no one was injured in the mishap. John Belmont, Associated Press. Needless to say, the people who comprised the crew of Mythbusters and all of those who lived in those neighborhoods, they quick the damage that can be incurred by one cannonball that has gone astray. Now, as I look over this congregation today, I doubt very seriously that there is anyone who has experienced the power of a, stray, of a stray cannonball. And yet, every one of us have experienced the power of words. Words can do 
anything. Words can edify. Words can lift up. Words can bring encouragement. Words can help someone be lifted from a pit of despair and given the courage to at least try one more time. But like the cannonball, words can also inflict damage. Words can destroy. Words can discourage. Words can intimidate. Words can threaten. Words can push an individual over the precipice to the point of despair and utter hopelessness. When we look throughout the world, we have seen how words have been used to change the world. Think of the words that were uttered by Sir Winston Churchill during his wartime speeches in Parliament. Think of the words that were uttered by Mother Teresa of Calcutta when she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and there took the time on the platform in 1979 to talk about the dignity of every human life and the life of the unborn. Think about the words that were uttered from Nelson Mandela in jail as he cried out against the evil system of apartheid. Think about the words of Pope John Paul II as he stood in Poland near that monastery and he cried out against the evils of communism that had gripped Eastern Europe and repressed religious expression. It was words that inspired us to send a man to the moon. It was the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr that caused all of us to dream of a day when there would be racial equality. It was the words of Billy Graham and other former presidents that were able to bring us hope and be able to bring us peace and be able to bring us stability as our nation faced some of its greatest crisis. Now, medical science is coming around to actually confirm that there really is power in words, power for good and also power for evil. In a study that was conducted in 2012, according and published in the National Library of Science, it spoke how words could actually affect the way that we experience pain. Patients that were being studied with MRI, it was discovered that when those around them, caregivers or doctors, were speaking words of encouragement, that actually the patient's ability to endure the pain improved. But when negative words were spoken, then suddenly the pain seemed to intensify in those patients. And it was all through the power of words. A later study that was conducted and published in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports uh, Physiology talked about how that patients who were going through orthopedic surgery were able to heal at a faster rate and endure periods of rehabilitation better when therapists were using words of encouragement. Words like, go. Words like, go as far as you can, enabled patients to be able to rehabilitate, regain their balance, and heal at a faster rate. But likewise, words can cause trauma. Study after study talks about the kinds of trauma long-term that people endure for having endured some of the abuse that they received verbally in their home as they were growing up. Just a study recently talked about how that college students, when they were subjected to peers that were verbally abusing them, the effects on the remainder of their college years and how that they were less motivated and less likely to be able to fulfill just the mundane obligations and routines of college life. 
And of course, all of us have seen domestic violence cases when there were partners that emerged from those domestic relationships having been verbally abused and suddenly finding themselves dealing with PTSD and other associated kinds of diagnosis. And all of it came because of words. Now, according to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, it is estimated that one out of five high school students find themselves being bullied in classes. It is also estimated that one out of six high school students endure bullying online, cyber bullying. It is also estimated that more than 30% of people in America that work in their environments do so in a hostile environment where they are enduring abuse and they are enduring verbal assaults. All because of words. Words, they are everywhere. There are one billion five hundred million words that comprise the 7,100 languages that are spoken in the world. In the English language alone, more than 500,000 words, according to the 20 volume books of the Oxford English Dictionary, 176,000 of those 500,000 words are still in use. The one thing we have in common, whether we do it through American Sign Language or whether we do it verbally, all of us are communicating every day through words. In fact, we are told that one-fifth of our life is spent communicating one to another with words. We speak, usually, depending on various contexts, at a rate of about 100 to 120 words per minute. It is estimated that every day, if every word you speak during the day is recorded, that at the end of the day, you would have 50 pages of words that you have spoken that day. In a year, 26,400 pages of words that you have spoken simply in a single year. And the incredible thing is that every single word in that dictionary, in those languages, or that we speak every day, every single one of them have the power of life and death. Perhaps that is reason why James devotes one-fifth of his letter to the subject of the words that we speak. After all, nothing reveals character. Nothing reveals motives. Nothing reveals the condition of one's heart quite like the words that people speak. Jesus put it like this. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. James, when he begins writing, he speaks to those of us who are teachers and those of us who are preachers and those of us who want to be teachers. And he says that doing so is a hazardous position because the instrument we use for communication is a tongue. And that tongue can be very unpredictable and it can be ungovernable. Therefore, he says in chapter 3, verse 1, Now many of you, not many of you, should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Among the churches of the New Testament, there were no positions, there were no offices that were more honored and more revered than that of a teacher. Teacher was one of the ascension gifts that Christ gave to the church to bring the church to maturity and to the unity of the faith. Within the church of Antioch alone, teachers were listed right along with prophets that were there that prayed over Paul and Barnabas and launched them into ministry. Jesus himself was a master teacher. He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The churches of the New Testament were teaching churches 
They continued steadfastly in the teaching of the apostles. Daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul said to Timothy, the things that you have received from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men and women that you may be able to teach others also. But as the church continued to grow and expand into faraway places, occasionally there were those who rose up within the church to try to arrogate the title of teacher to themselves. They became self-appointed teachers. Some of them became self-righteous teachers. Others of them became actually false teachers, motivated by selfish ambition and envy and greed. They wanted to be called teachers because they wanted the platform to be able to be seen and to be heard. And that's why James continued continues in chapter 3 and he says but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts don't boast about it don't deny the truth such wisdom so called does not come down from heaven but is earthly unspiritual demonic for where you have envy and selfish ambition there you find disorder and every evil practice here were teachers that were trying to gain prominence simply motivated by selfish ambition, wanting to be known as fountains of wisdom. But these so-called fountains of wisdom were actually autocratic, schismatic individuals that were creating division in the church. And so James says, no, that's not the wisdom that comes from above. That is the wisdom that is earthly. That is the wisdom that is demonic. Where you have envy and selfish ambition, there is every evil work. But he goes on to say, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Then it is peace-loving. It is considerate. It is submissive. It is full of mercy. It is full of good fruit. It is impartial. It is sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Teachers are needed. Teachers are noble. But realize that if you come to the position of a teacher, you will be judged more strictly. Because you have at your disposal to be able to speak to others this thing that is called a tongue. And then James pulls out from just teachers and says to everyone in verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. Words, the use of the tongue can be so destructive and yet it can be so healing. So there's a couple of things that James wants to teach all of us today. First of all, never underestimate the power of your words. Look at the illustration that he gives. He likens the tongue and the words that we use to a bit in a horse's mouth, to a rudder on a ship, or to a spark that causes a whole forest to begin to burn with fire. Let's look, beginning with verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark, just like a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder on a ship or the spark that comes from a single match. Words have power. Notice, first of all, he uses the illustration of a horse. Now, I'm told when I was growing up in Texas that an average-sized horse would weigh about, about 700 pounds, to 1,100 pounds, depending on its breed, depending on its size. And yet, a bit, 
a bit that weighs no more than a pound, a pound and a half, maybe two pounds at the most, when that bit is inserted very comfortably behind the incisors and in front of the premolars and is gently put down and attached to reins and a bridle, that little bit in a horse's mouth can turn a 700 pound or a 1,100 pound horse into the direction that a rider can go. Small, but powerful. Think about the rudder on a ship. One of the most interesting ships, one of the largest ships in the world at one time was the USS Eisenhower. This was this huge aircraft carrier this aircraft carrier, the USS Eisenhower, measured 1,100 feet in length. It weighed more than 90,000 tons. It was propelled by nuclear power, 250,000 horsepower. This USS Eisenhower had 6,100 people on the crew on that ship. It carried 100 aircraft. And yet, the USS Eisenhower, 1,100 feet long, 90,000 tons heavy, 6,100 people on it, 100 airplanes landing and taking off on it, could be turned and steered by a mechanical structure, a little rudder that was more than, not more than one-tenth of one percent of its size. Small that rudder is, but powerful. And then he says, just like a spark begins to set a whole forest on fire, Sometimes the biggest fires come from the smallest sparks. Just a few days ago in Millersburg, Ohio, you may have seen in the news how this four-apartment, two-level structure burned to the ground. Why? Because of one person and a misplaced match in a kitchen, and the whole thing burned to the ground. Maybe you were watching the Dolphins play last year. I doubt it. But if you happen to have been watching the Dolphins-Patriots game, Glenn Dent, you were probably watching that game last year. It, while the game was going on, those that were in the stands at Hard Rock Stadium began to notice smoke coming up from an adjacent parking lot. And they began to investigate, and sure enough, there were eight cars on fire while the game was going on. Why? Because one person forgot to turn their grill off when they were tailgating before they left it and went into the stadium. One little grill caused eight cars to be incinerated during a live television broadcast of the Dolphins and the Patriots game. A few years ago, one of the greatest fires in, San, or in California, in Southern California, was lit because of a 10-year-old who happened to be playing with a match. The Gatlinburg fires, you remember that, in 2016, that burned thousands of acres and caused the death of at least 14 people. It all happened happened because of teenagers who weren't really thinking much. They just casually threw out some matches. And as a result of the fire from that little spark, all of the thousands of acres were burned and lives were lost. Likewise, James says, the tongue is small, but oh, it can do so much for good or it can do so much for evil. The tongue is small. It only weighs about two ounces at the most, two and a half ounces. And yet the words that the tongue forms carry within them the power of life and the power of death, the power of blessing and the power of cursing. They carry, it carries within it the power of destiny or it carries with it the power of destruction. Now on the one hand, the tongue can produce words that bring a lifetime of blessings. The 
Bible tells us that a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. The Bible talks about words that are fit words, timely words. The Bible talks about as cool water is to a thirsty soul, so are good words and good news from a far country. Words that are spoken can bring blessing. They can bring encouragement. They can promote healing. They can do so much good. Good And actually that good could carry over a lifetime. There are some of you that remember the words that your mom or your dad spoke to you at specific moments in your life. They may be in heaven today, but you are continually blessed by the words that they spoke and the words that were spoken unto you. But on the other hand, there can be such damage that comes from from words, words can carry the power to damage. Unsanctified speech can scorch. Unsanctified speech can consume. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 talks about corrupt communication. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4, we read of coarse jesting and obscene words. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1, it speaks of fathers who are using words to provoke their children to anger. Proverbs talks about those who leave the way of righteousness and begin to talk in a perverse way manner. We read of perverse words in the book of Proverbs. We, we read of painful words. Job, in Job chapter 2 and verse 17, speaks of those who have iniquity under their tongue. In Psalm 5 and 8, we read of a flattering tongue. In, in, in Psalm chapter 10, we read of a tongue that is filled with bitterness. In Psalm chapter 12, we read about a proud tongue. In Psalm 15, we read about a deceitful tongue. In Psalm 52, we read about a tongue that can be as sharp as a razor. Words have power. Never underestimate the power of your words. Your words can bring life or your words can bring death. But the good news is the same tongue that was once set on fire by hell itself can be purged and set on fire by the Holy Spirit and begin to speak the wonderful works of God. God, never underestimate the power of your words. Never underestimate. James goes on to say the damage that can be done by duplicity. With one breath praising God and with another breath speaking curses and evil. Let's continue. He says in verse 9, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. There, James is talking about the damage that can be done with duplicitous talk. When we with one breath praise God and then right with the other breath we tweet or we put on Facebook or we actually say words that defame the very people who are made in the image of God. There's only one time in the Hebrew scriptures that the word hypocrisy appears. It is found in Isaiah chapter 26. And there, the word that is translated hypocrisy means that which is hidden, that which is beclouded, that which is done in subterfuge. The New Testament, the word translated for hypocrisy is a word that means or, or portrays an actor on a stage. An individual who is 
feigning, who is pretending, who is acting like they are something that really they are not. Jesus talked about and used that term to describe some of the false teachers who looked good, white, and polished on the outside, but inside they were full of death and full of dead men's bones and full of that which defiles. In fact, the apostle Paul said in the, in the last days in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that there would arise those who would be hypocritical liars. Now you talk about straight talk. There it is. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, this know also that in the latter times some will depart from the faith given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Peter said of false prophets and false teachers, there were false prophets among the people, there will be false teachers among you who privately, secretly, out of hypocrisy, will bring in strange doctrines, even denying the Lord that bought them. And he went on to say, rid yourselves of malice, rid yourselves of hypocrisy, and desire the pure milk of the word that you may be able to go there, to grow thereby. And if anyone, anyone knew the damage that can come from duplicitous talk, one day praising God, the other day cursing it was Peter, Peter who was that skilled fisherman from Galilee who was a follower of Jesus Christ. Peter, one of the more famous followers of Christ. When you read a list of disciples in your Bible, most likely Peter is the one that appears first. Peter, he's the one that was ready to walk on the water. Peter was the one who was willing to break the silence and say, well, how many times do I have to forgive someone who wrongs me? Seven times, is that all I have to do? Peter, the one that was always part of the inner circle, he was everywhere with Jesus. Peter, that man that saw Jesus turn water into wine. Peter, who was there to see Jesus take his mother-in-law by the hand and bring healing to his mother-in-law. Peter, the one that saw Jairus' daughter raised to life. Peter, the, the one that was on the Mount of Transfiguration and saw Jesus transfigured and his garments became glistering white, whiter so as no launderer on earth could wipe them. He was there and heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Peter, the one that was there at Capernaum at the very gates of hell where the God of Pan was worshipped and heard Jesus say, I will build my church and he he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, the one that was right there with Jesus right at the last supper, sitting right there with Jesus and saying to Jesus, though everyone else forsakes you, I will never forsake you. I am willing even to die with you. And yet 24 hours later, Peter is following Jesus as a distance as Jesus is standing before the Sanhedrin there in the courtyard of the high priest. He's warming his hands by the fire and a servant girl, a slave, comes and sees him and says loud enough for everyone else to hear, you're one of his. No, I am not one of his. He leaves the fire and goes out in the entranceway of the courtyard. But overhears the young girl say to others, see that man over there? He's a Galilean. He is one of Jesus' followers. No, I am not. And curses and swears that he does not know Jesus Christ. Luke, in his gospel, said, Then the rooster crowed, and Jesus looked out, possibly through the window of Caiaphas' house, and made eye contact with Peter. And Peter remembered the words of the Lord, and he began to weep bitterly. Within 24 hours, 
blessing God. And now with the same mouth, cursing and denying that he ever knew him. Weeping bitter tears. I wonder how many times you have found yourself weeping bitter tears because of things that have come out of your mouth. I wonder how many people in your household or in your sphere of influence have walked away from a conversation with you and they have wept bitter tears because they heard you in one breath professing a relationship with God and yet in another breath cursing and calling curses upon them and saying things that wounded and saying things that have hurt. My brothers and sisters, never underestimate the power of your words. Never underestimate the damage that can be done by duplicitous living and duplicitous conversations with your mouth praising God and yet your life belying the relationship that you claim to have. But lastly, I would say, never underestimate the power of Jesus to be able to take that which you cannot control and bring it under his control. Here's what James says. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. Though no human being can tame the tongue, <laughs> there is one who can tame, who can control that which you and I cannot control. If you want to change your language, change your life and surrender yourself completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about taming the tongue. It's surrendering the tongue to the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, what he can do, what he can do, what he can do with the sanctifying work of grace and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit how that he can not only purge your conscience and cleanse your heart, but even that which you speak, your language can change from denial and cursing to a language that proclaims the wonderful works of God. That's what happened to Peter. Peter, who had denied the Lord and who had disappointed himself and done damage to his own testimony, yet encountered Jesus again there on the shore of Galilee, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And it wasn't long until Peter, who had denied the Lord with his mouth, was again speaking the wonderful works of God on the day of Pentecost, preaching about Jesus who died and who rose from the dead. And if Peter can experience that kind of transformation in his language. So can you. So can I. So can we. Our sons and our daughters that came forward in that great altar call this last Sunday, they're looking for authentic Christians who have put the principle of their faith into the practice of their living. They are looking for those who live in the parsonage, what they preach in the pulpit. They are looking for those whose lives are changed and whose language and whose lifestyles testify to the true encounter that we have had with Jesus Christ. So I would say to you and I would say to all of us today, from the minor prophets, such as Hosea, bring with you words. Take words to the Lord. Words of repentance. Return to the Lord. And in so doing, he will abundantly pardon. And he will be able to heal. Maybe you're here today. You have been personally damaged 
by the words that people have spoken over you. You have been damaged by words that parents spoke about you or over you or to you. Words that siblings have spoken to you. Racial epithets that have put you down by people who claim to be Christians. Church people, church hurt because of people who claim to know God and yet they used words and talked down to you in a way that discredited you. I want to tell you today, you are made in the image of God. You are worth more than any. In fact, you are worth so much that Jesus gave his blood for you. He can bring restoration and he can bring healing to the damage that has been caused. Others of us here today, maybe we have been guilty and we have felt convicted by a conversation that we've had, language that we have used. Why not bring that to Jesus today? You know, as an alumnus of Lee University, I well remember the closing of every chapel service. We use the words from Psalm 19 to pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That perhaps is one of the most important prayers that we could ever pray at the beginning and at the close of each day. For our words do have power. They do have power to do damage, but they also have power to bless. May we today freshly commit ourselves, both in our self-talk and in the talk that we use with others, to speak words of blessing, words of grace, that our words would be seasoned with salt so that they might be able to lift up individuals and bring people hope. That's what we at North Cleveland are all about. We want to give people hope with the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to sharing with you more from the book of James very soon.